Chapter 2, Fried on Ice When I make presentations at schools, I usually begin by asking this question. How many of you want to grow up and become a drug addict? I always get the same reaction. Furrowed brows, smirks, a few nervous giggles, and incredulous looks exchanged among the kids, as if to say, yeah, right, what a dumb question. What loser would make it their goal to be addicted to drugs? The answer, of course, is that no one, certainly no young person, would deliberately set out to put themselves through the hell of addiction. Nobody wants to become an alcoholic or drug addict, and yet millions do, including me. The reasons why are complex and the focus of a great deal of study and debate. One thing the experts agree on is there seems to be some sort of genetic predisposition toward addiction. I certainly believe that's true, that I inherited the traits to become a drug addict, just as I inherited my eye color, my height, and my body's propensity for producing cholesterol. But does that fully explain what happened to me? In a way, I wish it was so. During the time I was using, that would have been a wonderful excuse. Sorry, can't help myself, I would say, as I downed 10 Valiums washed down with five shots of Jack Daniels. My genes are making me do this. It's inherited, don't you know? Yes, it's true that both my mother and her brother were addicts, and that I probably inherited this trait. But there are millions of other people who come from similar backgrounds and don't have a problem. Scientists now estimate that alcoholism has a heritability of only 40 to 60%. This is evident in the fact that even in families with alcohol or drug problems, you'll usually find at least one sibling who is not affected. What makes one sibling a self-destructive addict and another a respected professional who can drink socially if he chooses? What makes one person recognize that she can't handle alcohol or stop or moderate it while someone else, like me, just keeps on pounding them down? No one knows for sure but the latest theory is that addiction is influenced by a combination of factors, hereditary, psychosocial, and situational factors, or put it more simply, your genes, your environment, and the situation you find yourself in. A recent study was able to get closer than ever in pinpointing this relationship. At Uppsala University in Sweden, researchers found the presence of a specific genotype thought to cause alcoholism, as well as family relations, could predict alcohol consumption. It was the interaction of the two that was critical. A hereditary risk for alcohol consumption amplifies the risk of a poor environment and or vice versa, said Dr. Kent W. Nielsen, one of the researchers. Furthermore, our results suggest a hereditary risk may be prevented if the environment is good. Clearly, there's more to it than just your genes. There are circumstances that arise and there are choices we make that will increase or decrease the likelihood of us realizing our genetic potential. Based on this study, I had two strikes against me, hereditary and poor family environment. But I also made bad choices, including the choice not to help make the family environment better by perhaps being a little more receptive to my stepmom and half-brother and not always causing problems. Later, my decision-making abilities will improve. Otherwise, I wouldn't be writing this today. But early on, the poor judgment I showed, my inability to deal with the genetic hand I had been dealt, as well as the turbulent family situation I found myself in, ruined the thing most precious to me, hockey. You see, like the kids I talked to today, I didn't want to grow up to become an addict either. What I wanted to do was play in the NHL. I know most people think that ice hockey is popular only in Canada and maybe in a few cold weather U.S. locales such as Minnesota or Massachusetts but there has long been a robust hockey scene here in the heartland. Here in Ohio and neighboring Michigan, there are outstanding youth and junior teams and some very good high school and college teams. A number of professional players also hail from the Buckeye State. Sylvania happens to be one of those communities where hockey was popular. Popular enough that I didn't have to go searching for the game, it found me. My dad, his new wife Cindy, and I moved into our new home in the Grove Bell neighborhood in December 1972. There was a frog pond near the house and old 10 Mile Creek running behind it. Back then, both would freeze for much of the winter. Shortly after we arrived in the early months of 1973, I started watching the neighborhood kids playing hockey on the pond. I was six years old. I remember telling my dad that I wanted to play too. You have to learn to skate first, he said. 
I honestly can't remember the first time I ventured out on the ice to join the local kids. In my mind, it's almost as if I was suddenly there, on a pair of cheap rally skates, gliding awkwardly at first, I'm sure, across the shimmering surface. And once I was there, I never wanted to leave. Most of us have idyllic childhood memories, the time and place when everything seems so perfect. We almost wish our lives could have stayed frozen in that moment. For me, those moments are frozen indeed. I'm on the ice at the frog pond by the Grove Bell House playing hockey. I'm six or seven, and the harsh Midwest cold has made my cheeks red and my nose a little runny. But it doesn't bother me because I found this place, almost like another dimension, where I can fly across a flat, shiny surface, zigzagging around other skaters, on and on through a golden sunset. And I've got a hockey stick in my hands. I took to the game right away. The fast pace of play, the clatter of the sticks, the twinkle of the ice slivers that would appear when skates carved the surface, with that beautiful shrup sound, it was all magic to me. At age eight, I joined my first team. I was a mite, playing in the Sylvania Youth Hockey League, sponsored by Hamill Manufacturing, a local two and die maker. I played defense that year as well as the next, in the nine-year-old league, when I played for the Rems Flyers. Even then, I had already taken a liking to the idea of trying to stop the puck. I didn't want to score. I wanted to deny those who would score on me. I liked the idea of somehow blocking, smacking down, catching, kicking away this black hard rubber disc that might come flying at me at any moment from any angle. This was all leading me to one place, the net. In hockey, the guy who stands in front of it, defending against the shots of the opposing team, is the goalie. It's a position that some say is one of the toughest to play in all sports. One reason I was a natural choice was that no one else wanted to do it. Goalies have a reputation for being cocky, for having a kind of gunslinger attitude. You think you can shoot that puck past me? I say you can't. Let's get it on. This suited me fine. In the days before cable, I would watch the Toronto Maple Leafs play on CBC, Channel 9, which we'd pick up from Windsor, Ontario. I became an avid fan watching the Leafs, and within a short time, I was watching every NHL game we could pick up, paying close attention to the goalies. My favorite was Billy Smith of the New York Islanders. We had the same birthday, December 12th, and so I thought the same kind of personality. Born in Perth, Ontario in 1950 and was nicknamed Batlin Billy Smith, had a temper and wasn't afraid to use a stick on players crowding the crease, the semicircle around the goalie's nest. He played fiercely, and he never took any guff from any opposing player. Oh yeah, and he was a winner. The Islanders of my boyhood, the 1970s, were an expansion club that was developing into a powerhouse, a team that would go on to win four straight Stanley Cups from 1980 through 1983. And Smith was one of the keys to their success. He shut out the best players of his generation, including, in one memorable Stanley Cup final against the Edmonton Oilers, both Wayne Gretzky and Mark Messier, two of the greatest scorers in NHL history. He was even a lefty like me. Boy, did I want to be Billy Smith. I have never met Billy Smith, but in 1973, I would meet a guy who would have more of a profound and direct effect on my hockey and on my life than any NHL star, Jim Cooper, who at the time was the manager of the local indoor rink, the Tamashaner, in Sylvania, would coach me on several youth teams and later at Northview High School, where he became head hockey coach in 1975 and continues to this day. Tall, thin Coop spoke with a deep, resonant, and reassuring voice. He was generally cool and calm on the outside and a warm, caring man on the inside who became and remains one of my closest friends. Coop had played hockey at Whitmer High School in Toledo, Ohio, which would later become our big rival. He had just been hired as the rink manager in 1974 when my stepmom brought me there. He remembers me, in his words, as a little towhead blonde with one of those cereal bowl haircuts. I didn't have skate guards to protect the flimsy blades of those skates, so Coop carried me across the parking lot and onto the ice. With the skills I was learning at the TAM and my single-minded dedication to hockey, I became a pretty decent player, good enough that in 1975, at age 9, I began playing for the local travel team. Schreiner Realty was our sponsor, and appropriately so, as we covered a lot of real estate that season, traveling all over the upper Midwest, playing other youth teams. I would do this on various teams for seven long seasons, spending almost every weekend from the end of August until mid-March on the road. We played in Detroit, 
Cincinnati, Columbus, Cleveland, Chicago. We traveled to Pennsylvania, New Jersey, West Virginia, and the mecca of hockey, Canada, where we played teams in Windsor, Toronto, and Montreal. Our teams were good, too, and I'm proud to say I think I was an important part of their success. They knew that with TC, as my teammates started to call me, in the net, we had a chance, so as long as our guys could score a few, which they usually did. In 1980, I was selected to play for a Toledo-based team that competed in the Michigan National League. We were the only Ohio team in that league which produced a number of outstanding college players and a number of future NHL stars, including Pat LaFontaine, who became a star with the Rangers and Islanders, Al Iafrady of the Toronto Maple Leafs, and Jimmy Carson of the Detroit Red Wings. It was another rung on a ladder that I felt was surely leading me to a career in professional hockey. Seven years is a long time for a young person. Through hockey, I not only traveled the interstates of Ohio and Michigan to exotic places like Fort Wayne, Indiana, and Trenton, New Jersey, but I also took a personal journey from childhood to adolescence. The game, however, was really all that mattered to me. Not school, not the family I now felt estranged from. Those proverbial inner demons, conjured in part by the discovery of that letter revealing my mother's suicide, were dormant inside my mind, but about to come alive. It began in May 1980, near the end of 8th grade. I was at a party at the house of a kid who was already headed for trouble. His parents were away, and he and a few of his other buddies had managed to score some cheap beer. At one point in the party, they brazenly whipped out cans, popped the tops, and started drinking. Impulsively, I asked one of the guys if I could try some. Sure, he said, passing the can over to me. I took a sip of beer. Almost as soon as I swallowed, a sort of shimmer seemed to run down the length of my body. I remember distinctly realizing that I had crossed some kind of line at that moment and sensing that my life was going to change, and not for the better. I was right. This was an important threshold. Let's go back to the scientific literature for a moment. The age at which a person takes his or her first drink has been carefully studied by researchers in substance abuse. It's deemed important enough that it rates its own acronym, AFD, Age of First Drink. In 2001, a University of Michigan study found that adolescents with at least one parent who experienced an early AFD were more likely to do so themselves. I don't know exactly how old my mom was when she took her first drink, But considering that she was a heroin addict by the time she was 21, it's a safe bet she was pretty young. In addition, these children of early AFD parents, especially the boys, were more likely to demonstrate what the researchers called conduct disorder and a pattern of rebelliousness. This was me to a T. I'm almost surprised these researchers didn't find that these adolescent males from early AFD families also tended to become goalies on hockey teams. I only had a few sips that night. I didn't get drunk or demand to have more and more. Still, in the back of my mind, I knew something was wrong. Fast forward three months, I'm now entering my freshman year at Northview High School in Sylvania. Still playing hockey on a hot shot travel league team, still living in Grove Bell, still just a kid who had taken just a few sips of beer. The Friday night after our first week of school, some buddies of mine had planned to go watch Northview's football team play their opening game of the season. We decided to have a few drinks first. Hey, we were now big shot freshmen. We'd survived the first week of school. It was the first time a lot of us had seen each other since last June, so what the heck. We went to my friend Gary's house. Years later, he would be the best man at my wedding. But if he had never spoken to me again after that night as freshman in 1980, I would have understood. We opened the liquor cabinet in his parents' house. I spotted a bottle of Jack Daniels, cracked it open, and began guzzling. I consumed an entire fifth of that stuff, the whole bottle, and to top it off, took two hits of speed that I bought. By the time we got to the football game, I could hardly stand up. Gary told me later I had turned blue and he got scared that I was going to die. We couldn't go to the game with me like that, so he and the other guys, none of whom had drank nearly as much as me, had to carry me back to his house. When we got there, I had to use the bathroom. I went into what I thought was his bathroom and urinated all over Gary's closet, ruining a brand new jacket. I'd gone from taking a few sips of beer to chugging a fifth of Jack Daniels with a speed chaser just the second time I indulged. 
I should have realized that this was not for me. Instead, it was just the opposite. I wanted more. The beast within me was up on its hind legs and bang. That kind of behavior continued during my freshman and sophomore years. I wasn't drinking every day, only on weekends. But when I did, I would drink until I passed out or couldn't remember what had happened. It was beginning to affect my hockey. I'd go out drinking with my buddies on Friday night, get wasted, and the next day when we'd play a game, I felt awful. This was the progression of addiction. This was also about the time my friends started to notice that something was wrong with me. A couple of their parents even called my parents to tell them I was having a problem. They refused to believe it. My dad's attitude was, how could this be? He's a star athlete. He knows what his mom went through. He wouldn't touch this stuff. Of course, I fed this illusion, swearing up and down that I wasn't drinking. I was 16 now, about to enter my junior year at Northview High School. My hockey career was going really well. I had played well in the Michigan National League, and it was time for me now to take my next step to the Junior A League. Despite its name, the Juniors are akin to a developmental league in Major League Baseball, the first stepping stone to a professional career. My family had been on vacation in Cape Cod, and the day we came back, the letter arrived from Paddock Pools, one of the big sponsor Junior A League teams in Detroit. They were inviting me to join them. I remember running right from the mailbox into my house to tell my dad, that's great, he said, but you know you're not playing there. I was dumbfounded. My dad said there was no way he would allow me, a 16-year-old with a new license and some questionable behaviors, to drive an hour from Sylvania to Detroit every day after school. It was a real blow. He and I still disagree on this. I have four young children now, and if one of them ever has an opportunity to do something special with a talent, be it playing hockey or the violin, I'm going to get behind them and help them take it as far as they want to go with it. In retrospect, I see that moment as decisive, a detour that killed my chances for becoming a professional hockey player and helped put me on the road to becoming an addict. In fairness to my dad, Coach Cooper didn't think it would have made a difference. The real death of that dream came with the decision to get involved in all of this off-ice curricular crap, he said. That would have happened whether you went to Detroit or not. Regardless, instead of an eager young player in juniors, I was now an angry, dispirited kid on my way to playing for Coop on a Northview High School team that was inferior to the one I could have joined in Detroit. I could have tried to be a more constructive member of the Northview team. I could have kept my act together. Instead, I joined the high school team that fall thinking, you're lucky to have me, and I'm going to play my way. So I flouted rules, often angered Coach Cooper, but played well enough that I could get away with it. I had a good year in goal as a junior at Northview. Not only had I fine-tuned my game, I fine-tuned my arrogant attitude. I like to make big flashy saves, giving the shooters on the other team more of a target by positioning myself at an angle that would reveal a little of the net behind me. It was a tease. When they'd try to put it through, I'd shoot my glove up there and stop it. I played what goalies called the butterfly style. Smith did this too. When the other team was around my net, I'd get down on both knees with my legs out to the side in a V position. I'd provoke fights, too, egging the opposition on so they'd lose their cool. When one of the opposing players would finally get so ticked off he'd throw a punch, I had my big goons on the team who'd come out and beat the stuffing out of that guy, who in turn would also get a penalty for having started the melee. It got so that not only the other teams, but also their fans got to know me. In the game before the state finals that year, we played our arch rival, Whitmer High School in Toledo. They were a good team. Some of their guys had played with me in the Michigan National League. The Whitmer fans hated my guts because of my showboat attitude. That night, a whole bunch of them crowded around the glass behind the net, screaming, Crandall sucks. I loved it. The game was really close. At one point, Whitmer got a penalty shot. That's a one-on-one situation. The puck is placed on center ice and the player on offense gets to take the puck to the net with only the goalie and the penalized team there to defend against him. Stopping one of these is tough yet critical. A successful penalty shot can change the momentum of a game. That night, the Whitmer player, a good skater and shooter, one of my former teammates from the National League, skated toward me, took his shot, and I made a fancy glove stop to deny him. Immediately, I bolted out of the net, skated right up to the glass where all those Crandall-hating fans were congregated, and gave them the finger. Boy, did that tick them off. 
We lost that game 2-1 to one because our defense fell apart with a minute and 17 left. I was angry, of course, but I must say I got a certain satisfaction out of the fact that the Whitmer security guards had to escort me out of the building for my own safety. While my game was coming together, the rest of my life was falling apart. I was now drinking every day, and I had moved beyond hits of speed to other drugs, marijuana, Valium. It still wasn't as bad as it would become, but it was getting there. By my senior year, I was packing my bong along with my goalie mask and pads when I went off to practice every morning at 5.15. At 6.30 or 7, as soon as I got out of practice, I'd head back to my car with some buddies of mine and we'd fire up that bad boy, inhaling a dime bag or so of weed before class started. This would continue throughout the day. Weed, Valiums, tranquilizers, alcohol. In the parking lot, in the boys' room, sometimes even in the classroom when we had a substitute teacher. How does a junior in high school get the money to have a car and buy all these drugs? Well, I worked part-time at the family business, Sylvan Studios, manufacturers of awards, ribbons, and plaques, where I put medals together, doing mailings and other menial stuff. That helped pay for the booze and the weed. Valium, Speed, and any other type of pharmaceutical was at my disposal thanks to a friend who worked at a drugstore and did me favors. Somehow I managed to get passing grades, but if I could have, I would have just played hockey and partied. By my senior year, my hair was getting long, I had gotten my left ear pierced, and I walked around all the time wearing sunglasses. I wanted to look like a heavy metal goalie, a member of Motley Crue on skates. Coop wasn't happy. He would give me lectures about cleaning up my act, and I would yes him to death, then go back to what I was doing. My senior year began on an auspicious note. The first Friday of school, I did my first line of coke. I instantly knew I had found what I was looking for in the drug world. That stuff grabbed a hold of me and wouldn't let go, nor did I want it to. I was amped up, out of control, and coke soon became a daily part of my life. I did a few lines before school, before practice, before everything. I was joined in this new passion by my friend Ferd, a terrific hockey player I knew from the Michigan League who had just transferred to Norfew. Hockey, cocaine, and my buddy Ferd, a winning combination as far as I was concerned, and it seemed that way when the season began. In retrospect, I don't know how I even got on the ice to play as wasted as I was, but we did, and we played pretty well. Early that season, we beat my former travel team from Toledo 2-1. I had a good game and was really stoked about that. In November 1984, the night before we were leaving for a major state tournament at Miami University in Oxford, I got busted for underage drinking by the cops. A few of us were driving around Sylvania. We stopped at a traffic light and my buddy Ferd, who was driving, lit up a joint. Bad timing. There was a cop right next to us. Ferd tried to pretend it was a cigarette he was smoking, holding it nonchalantly between his two fingers. The cop didn't fall for it. He pulled us over, finding the weed in the front seat and my case of beer in the back. They took us to the local jail. We didn't get charged, however, and we were released to the custody of our parents, who of course weren't very pleased. Somehow, Coop got word of what happened. I went with the team to Miami, but when we got there, he made me sit out a game. Still, he didn't tell the school because he knew what the penalty would have been. Ferd made a big difference on the team, and he helped raise my game as well. We won the first three games after the Christmas break. Ferd had 27 points in those games, and I had two shutouts. The third game in that streak was memorable for a number of reasons. It started with Ferd and I buying a quarter ounce of Coke, which is a lot of blow, for $400, which is a lot of money for two high school kids. We were playing a team from Jackson, Michigan, and for the entire 90-mile ride to the game, we did lines in the back of the bus. This was a big game for a number of reasons. First, we were on a roll. A victory here was one more step toward the state championships. Second, Sylvania Northview had a history of bad blood with Jackson Lumen Christie High School, and their fans were as rowdy and vocal as Whitmer's. Before the game started, Coop told me to make sure I didn't skate off the ice with the other team at the end of the second period. So what did I do? The horn blows after the second period, which were already kicking their butts, their teams coming off the ice, And instead of waiting and skating off with the Northview guys into our locker room, as I was ordered to do, I skate right through the team from Michigan. In hockey, that's a flagrant violation of etiquette, especially with two teams who don't like each other to begin with. Words were exchanged, and in a few seconds, fists were flying. It started a big melee. 
In the locker room, Coop was furious, and rightly so. He grabbed my face mask and shook it. I told you not to do that, he screamed. I just shrugged and sniffed. Apparently, I'd been doing a lot of that. What's the matter, he said, puzzled. You have a cold? Despite the drugs and the fight, that night was one of the best of my career. I stopped 60 shots, Ferd and the rest of the guys were awesome, and we won 10 to nothing, my second shutout in three games. On the bus ride home that night, we celebrated with more coke, snorting our lines in the back where we thought none of the adults could see us. The next morning, Coop called. Even now, 20 years later, he remembers it as one of the most tragic days of my life. On the phone, his voice was trembling. I thought at first somebody had died. How could you have done this to me, he said. I didn't know what he was talking about. He told me that someone on the team had reported to him that we were doing drugs on the bus. I denied it, forgot about the whole thing, and went to school on Monday as if nothing had happened. After class, I ambled into the locker room for practice as usual. I was half-dressed when a grim-looking coop came in and told me he wanted to talk to me in his office. I went in, he closed the door, and he told me I was out. Kicked off the team. The words were barely out of his mouth when I ran out of his office, half-dressed in pads and skates, dove across the locker room bench where a bunch of my teammates were getting dressed, and tried to strangle the guy I knew had ratted us out. I didn't think so at the time, but Coop did what he had to do. I had an obligation to the parents of the other kids on the team to protect their kids from that stuff, he says today. I had to remove you and Ferd for the good of the group. Maybe so, but even Coop had no control over what would happen next. That night, the school principal apparently held a little inquest into the situation. Parents and kids were called in to, quote, testify. No one called me or my parents, however, until the next morning. During second period, I was handed a note directing me to the principal's office immediately. When I arrived, Ferd was walking out. Just resign or we'll be in more trouble, he whispered loudly as I entered the office of the principal, who sat there with his sternest, you're in real trouble, young man, look. The athletic director was seated to his right. Both of these men were new in their jobs, a fact that I didn't know or could appreciate at the time. The principal started talking, and his demeanor was dead on. I was in real trouble. He accused me of using drugs on the team bus. I acted like James Cagney under the hot lights. You don't have anything on me, I said, like the insolent wise guy I was. Then the athletic director, whom I had taken a strong disliking to during his first few months at Northview, started talking. I glared at him. This guy, I thought in my anger, didn't know anything about the situation, and now he was butting in. Where was my coach? Where was my accuser? Where was anybody who had actually been there? Later, Coop would learn that he was under suspicion as well, that there were concerns that he was too loose in his program and couldn't control the kids on his team. Pure baloney, of course. He was and is a great asset to that school and to our community. Still, the decision that had been arrived at without his input was draconian. Then I hear the principal say the words, We're expelling you. If you don't agree and sign this, we're going to turn this over to the police. Again, I snapped. This time I lunged across the desk trying to get the AD. People rushed in to break it up. It was like another hockey melee, except this time there was no way to make a save. I was out. My hockey career was over. I'd been kicked out of school. A whole new nightmare world beckoned.